I'm Stephen Foskett, and we're here in San Francisco for Cloud Field Day. We're visiting companies in the cloud space, and uh, we've got a panel of invited delegates who are writers, speakers, podcasters, bloggers, that sort of thing. We've invited them to come here, presentations, to ask questions, and to represent the audience that is not in the room. If you're interested in learning more about Tech Field Day, go to techfieldday.com, and you can find lots of videos from our events at youtube.com slash techfieldday. Hey everyone, my name is Vivek Saraswath. I'm a product manager here at Docker on our Docker data center team. Uh, this is Cloud Tech Field Day. Um, agenda for today, we'll talk a little bit about what Docker is. Uh, then we'll talk about Docker orchestration, sort of running it on a multiple cluster environment. We'll talk about our work with Docker and Microsoft, uh, particularly Windows-based containers. We'll talk about Docker data center, uh, the enterprise commercial solution. And then we'll have a little bit of a hands-on exercise for you to test out some of the products and software yourselves. So we'll start with my section first. Uh, what is Docker? So a little introduction into Docker and to containers and how they differ and, are, and or are similar to VMs. Again, I'm Vivek Saraswat. So. so what is Docker? Docker is an open platform that helps companies to build, ship, and run their applications anywhere. And that's really the, the primary key for the folks of Docker is it's all about the applications. It's all about enabling developers to build their applications and run them across multiple environments more easily. That has a lot of implications for the IT world as well. So there's a lot of work in both areas. But really the key to thinking about Docker and thinking about containers is that it's all about the applications. Docker and containers are the driving force behind a lot of modern app initiatives today. Uh, you've all heard things like microservices, cloud, and DevOps. Uh, these are some of the major initiatives that we're seeing in the market on the IT side. And Docker is really central to a large part of these. Uh, in a survey that we had from the state of app development, Docker is central to about 80% of uh, companies' cloud strategies. About 44% of companies looking to adopt DevOps are looking at Docker and containers as a way of achieving that means. And of course, the whole idea of microservices, of taking a monolithic application and composing it into a number of independent services, containers are a core part of that concept. So as companies are looking to transform the way that IT works for them today, really Docker is at the central of how a lot of them are looking, looking to do that. So what exactly is a container? Just a question, how many people in the audience are familiar with the concept of containers? Okay, so some people. Some perhaps not, so I'll try to talk to you a little bit about what it is. In essence, a container is what you might consider a virtualized application. It is a isolated unit that contains uh, an application, all of its binaries, libraries, and dependent packages that sits on top of an operating system. So for, any, for a given operating system, today it's Linux, tomorrow it'll be Windows and several other uh, architectures, you add a daemon known as the Docker engine, which allows you to create these isolated units called containers that contain the application, its binaries, and libraries. Uh, all, of these uh, all of these containers are isolated from each other in that they own a particular section of resources, but they all sit in one shared set of resources, and that's uh, the host itself. Importantly, that host can be either a physical host like a server, or it could be a virtualized host like a VM. And we'll get into a little more about what containers and VMs are and how they're different, but that's some of the, really the important thing to think about is that a container really virtualizes an application for you and it can sit upon any, uh, it can sit upon a virtualized uh, host environment or a physical host environment. And the goal is to be able to move that to, and run it in as many environments as you need to with a degree of isolation for that specific application. So there's a couple of terms here on the right. You can see you have the, the kernel, the base operating system, and then you have a series of images, which a container is based out of a series of layers of which only one is really visible to the user, and that's the, the writable layer at the top. We'll go into that in a little more detail, but I really I wanted to just get that point across is that really containers are about the application, not about the underlying infrastructure. And the second point then is that containers aren't actually VMs. So I know I said that a container is a virtualized application. Uh, which, so in a sense, it's easy to make the connection that maybe they're the same as VMs because they're, they're, they're both in some sense a form of virtualization. But really, if a container is a virtualized application, a VM is a virtualized machine. It's a virtualized infrastructure itself. So fundamentally, there's very different architectures between a container and a VM. If you consider one to be an application thing and one to be an operating system or infrastructure thing. And they also have fundamentally very different benefits. So we like to put this in the form of an analogy to make it a little easier to go through. 
you can think of a VM as a house. A, VM, a, a house has a set, its own, its own set of rooms, serves a purpose, like a residence for a family. It has its own set of plumbing and infrastructure, so it has you know, electricity, it has water running systems, garbage, etc. And all of that is fundamentally its own isolated unit. Uh, and houses take a good amount of resources to build, right? It takes a little while to construct a single house. Uh, and that single house is, again, fully isolated and fully self-contained to an extent that it, gets, it has all the things that it needs in order to accomplish its specific purpose. Containers are like apartments. So apartments, typically there's many apartments inside of a single apartment complex. Uh, each of those apartments serves a specific purpose. It serves as a residence for that small little group. However, all of those apartments share a set of resources. Typically, the electrical system, the plumbing, all of that is you know, part of the larger apartment building, and all the apartments are within that building. Now, the apartment building itself might take a while to build, but an individual apartment, because it's sharing all those resources, can be built pretty quickly. And an individual apartment has its own set of isolation, too. You've got your locked door. You have your, your ability to go into different areas. Each one is separate. But again, it's faster to build up a series of apartments, each of them because they're identical, but they have their own internal, their internal design, and they have shared resource. So again, whereas the VM house might be something that takes a little while longer to build, serves, you know, has its own isolated set of resources, and, uh, uh, and uh, instead, an apartment complex and a, a container might be an individual apartment within an apartment complex, there might be tens, hundreds, or if you're in a really big apartment complex, thousands of rooms, uh, which are a part of this giant building. So then, how does that underlie to actual technical details? Well, a container, again, is, has shared resources, like, a, like an apartment complex might have electricity, water, etc. It's lighter weight because they're sharing several sets of resources together, so it can be spun up quickly. Faster instantiation, last record I heard is roughly 32 to 64 milliseconds on average for a single containerized application. There's no hypervisor. There's no baseline infrastructure. You can set it up on a physical infrastructure if you want. Runs particularly on Linux and Windows today. Uh, can be used to build either this idea of a monolithic application. You can put everything you want in that container. Go back to an apartment. You can have one giant flat. Let's say uh, you live in a penthouse apartment. Or you could have a tiny studio, which if you're in San Francisco, like me, you're probably more likely to have a studio. Uh, or you could have microservices. Again, you can branch out and have smaller sets of containers that each run a particular part of the service. And there's full stack portability. You can run this in a lot of different environments. VMs, on the other hand, are isolated resources. So it's an operating system and everything that that operating system needs to function. Uh, virtual memory, virtual CPU, virtual storage. It's the full OS and all of the applications inside of that OS. It can take several minutes to boot. Uh, and it's specifically a hypervisor base, something like ESX for vSphere or uh, KVM or Hyper-V in Microsoft. There's no underlying OS needed because you create the OS when you create the VM. And it's particularly only usable for monolithic applications, meaning that everything that that application needs is usually put into a single VM. So one important point we want to make here is that containers and VMs are different, but they're not mutually, mutually exclusive. So in the box you see here, you can see each of these individual boxes represents a single container. Just the application and the libraries and binaries that that application needs. Uh, that can run on a bare metal server, which is what you see right here. A physical server, that physical server has some operating system, like a Linux-based operating system. That runs the Docker engine, which is the daemon that creates containers. And then you have a bunch of containers. But you can also run containers within VMs just fine. So you can have the physical server. You can have the hypervisor like vSphere on top of it. Each of those, uh, that hypervisor will create new VMs, which is what each of these boxes represents with the OS. And then each of those VMs can run its own set of containers as well. And you can set up a model of running one container per VM, or you can run multiple containers to, uh, per VM. For us at Docker, that makes no difference. People are using containers in order to build applications. It's OK whether it runs in VMs or whether it runs in physical. And if somebody wants to start using it in VMs and then maybe transition to, to physical later or vice versa, we are totally OK with that. The idea here is all about portability. Can you really move your applications between different kinds of environments without really caring what that environment is? <clears throat> so more on that point, containers allow you to abstract your application, to abstract your, your, 
development at the application level. So this is really all about portability and standardization. So let's say you build your application inside of a VM, as we talked about before. Let's say you're running, you're running in vSphere right now and you create uh, applications built in vSphere VMs. It's a little more difficult to translate that, say, into either another on-premise hypervisor solution, or let's say you want to move your application to AWS. It's not quite as easy to transfer because the VM formats are typically pr proprietary. But now let's say that you've built your applications in containers. You can still run those applications in a vSphere-based environment inside of containers. But when you want to move them over to, say, Microsoft Azure to run in Hyper-V, or AWS to run in EC2 VMs, all you have to do is start up new containers within those VMs. As long as, long as they're running the Linux operating system, or in the future the Windows operating system, it's really easy to make that move. So containers abstract at the application level, they're portable. You can move apps without actually having to do any recoding. You can standardize, but you know, similar to the way vSphere allowed you to, and hypervisors allowed you to uh, abstract away server requirements, now you can abstract away virtualized requirements and focus just on the code you need. Yes? Question. <clears throat> standardize. Mm -hmm. Are you going to? People, lots of people are asking for a Docker container standard, and Docker has said no because that would restrict our ability to innovate. So, because for example, when you VMware, um, your vSphere VM standard thing, there is an open VM standard mm -hmm. that no one uses. Right. Um, what, what, is the, what is the approach for Docker? Because if various people are saying we want to have at least a minimum set of what the container image should be, what is that standard? Because of process. this reason. Yeah. So, is that, is that a thing that Docker is going to get behind or not? Or yeah, so I, to be honest, I can't speak too much to the larger sort of container standards like Run C or, or, you know, or the OCI initiative. What I can say is that the Docker API itself represents a fairly <coughs> standard, standardized set of notions for containers. Okay. So you can run the Docker, a Docker API based containers across pretty much any of these environments. So there's a larger set of discussions around you know, putting a standardization beyond the Docker API underneath at the daemon level, and should that be, you know, does, does that potentially restrict innovation or does it help push things forward? So to me, that's a set of discussions which um, I'm not involved too much in. Hmm. So I focus more on, you know, using the available Docker API, how can you move from one environment to another? What are your thoughts on it, Justin, actually? Because we just saw the difference between S3 and uh, CDMI this morning. Yep. One that wasn't shackled by standards. Don't get me wrong, standards are, are a good thing, but early in like a product's life cycle, it can be challenging, right? Yep. I, I'm just curious what like people think. It, would it be a good thing to have like a, you know, standards make it easier for other people to write to something? Uh -huh. which is, like S3 is a de facto standard because it's, I, it's something uh, that people appreciate write to. that. But Amazon can change it at any time they yes, want. Yes, they can, and it's the, exactly the same situation that we have with Docker containers. Yeah. Yeah, but the, so Docker, the Docker's handles some of this just on the OCI side, right? The mm -hmm. runtime environment is at least consistent yeah. and, and standardized based. Mm -hmm. The innovation on top, I think, is, is debatable about going from there. At least the runtime portion is consistent across the board. So yeah. I, I don't have a huge issue with that. I mean, you get to choose at that point about whether you want to adopt it or not adopt it. And there are other frameworks you can adopt if you choose that you feel the innovation is outpacing and, and, and diverging too much. You can, you can go with someone who isn't doing that. Yeah, because I, I just think it is a really good question, and it's quite hot at the moment. Yep. But, like, I'm not a massive fan of standards, to be honest, right? Um, but especially in the early life cycle of a product. But just with you bringing it up there, Justin, I was curious what, whether anybody had any thoughts. Um, mostly because it's topical, and I, yeah. I, various people have approached uh -huh. me before oh, yeah, coming yeah. here to, to ask about it. So yeah. it was interesting. Um, for me, myself, I, I think it's too early. Uh -huh. um, I, and I don't have a particularly firm view. There are... There are benefits to standards, and like you say, too early is it slows things down, too late, and, and if, if it changes a lot. So S3 is quite useful because Amazon doesn't change it too much. Mm -hmm. But if, so for example, if there was, if there's a complete lack of standard, then no one can use that, and that actually kills your ecosystem. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a terrific, it's tricky, because if, if Docker innovates too much, and changes all the stuff, then it breaks the ecosystem, and then you can't be that platform that every startup wants to be. So, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I agree with you. I think it is a tricky balance. I don't know if there's like a single right answer yet right now. And I think there's various 
various folks both within Docker and outside in the ecosystem that are trying to figure it out. Mm. Uh, any, other, any other questions? All right, so, so yeah, we talked about, again, standardization being a very hot topic these days. Um, there's also a cost optimization uh, benefit here. The ability, if you have some amount of standardization and the ability to portably move your apps across different kinds of infrastructures, you can start consolidating data centers, migrating to clouds, or migrating from different clouds to other clouds or to other data centers with a whole lot less conflict. So really, you have the freedom to choose what kind of an environment you want to run on based on the cost implications or the operational implications uh, uh, for, your, for your business. So I think that's one of the key, some of the key benefits of using containers, whether you're running them in VMs or not, whether you're running them side by side with VMs, or whether you're running them in a physical environment. So just a couple quick glossary of terms, given that the next couple of presentations uh, will walk through a lot of this. So a Docker image is how an application should be built. This is the basis of a Docker container. Uh, a Docker image, and I'll, I'll show some, um, I'll, I'll show an example of this in a moment, contains all the layers that your container is going to be built out of, including the base, uh, base operating system, programming languages, binaries, libraries, and then the actual application you've built yourself. So that image, this is the gold standard by which you would create the application itself. You mentioned like OVF, for example, as an open virtualization format. You can use an OVF to instantiate a number of VMs. An image is kind of the same way. You can use a Docker image to instantiate as many containers, the actual runtime of the application as you want. So this is how you determine what's actually going to be built. Then the Docker container is the standard unit in which a single application service resides. So you can spawn multiple containers in a matter of seconds uh, based on that single image. Uh, the Docker engine, this, is a, uh, this will often be used interchangeably with the term Docker daemon. You might hear both. Uh, this is the unit that sits on top of the operating system, and it's what creates, ships, and runs the Docker containers. The Docker engine can be deployed on pretty much any physical or virtual uh, host that's running Linux, and also, as uh, Michael Fries will talk about later, running Windows as well. And this can sit, again, in a data center, in a cloud service provider. From Docker's perspective, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's just a process that's running on the operating system. But that's what manages the actual creation of the container from the image. Uh, and finally, the last key term you might hear is Docker Data Center. Uh, this is what I work on. It's the integrated enterprise solution for building, deploying, and managing containerized workloads, really creating an application lifecycle based off of the, the open source Docker tools. Uh, so what I wanted to do before we move on is just do a, you know, a very quick demo of how, you know, how a Docker container is created and show off some of these portability aspects. So this is a, a sample application called CatWeb. We demoed this at VMworld 2016. Uh, oh, full screen, sorry. Let me see if I can. Does that help a little bit more? Yeah, that matter? Oh, OK, sorry. <laughs> um, so we talked about how an image is based off of a series of layers. So you'll see here, this says from Alpine. That's the base Linux packages. So the Linux OS that the operating system uses contains the kernel. You set up a, on top of that, what are the Linux packages you want? So that'll be Alpine in this case, which is a very lightweight Linux distribution. Uh, below that, are, you're installing Python and pip. So we're, in, we're installing the programming languages that this application will use. Uh, and then it says a couple of different files that are a part of this application, this requirements text file, and then a Python app. Uh, so this, is, this Docker file is what's used to build the actual image which is a series of these layers. You can think of these as layers in reverse. This is the base image. This is the bottom with the operating system packages. This is the languages you'll use, and this is the actual application. Uh, and then the application itself is a really simple Python application that serves up some, a couple of, uh, of images and websites. So let's go ahead and show how that sort of looks like. I have a, this is uh, my own personal terminal. I'm running, uh, what's called Docker for Mac, which is uh, a really simple way to get Docker run, like a, a very integrated VM that runs Docker processes on your Macintosh. There's also a Docker for Windows as well. So I do a quick Docker PS. It shows me what containers I have running. Um, it already shows I have one running. I'm going to remove that very quickly so you can see what we're about to do. 
Uh, so I'm going to run this application very quickly. So we're going to do what's called docker run that creates the container from the image. I'm going to do dash D, which means that the container will, will run in the background and won't be quit automatically. And dash B to expose the ports that are coming out of this application. And then I'm going to do the name of this application, which is called uh, catweb. This is from the... Okay, so that just created the container within less than a second. So I'm going to do docker ps, which allows me to see my containers. And I can see that it's up and running. Up through, uh, it was created a couple seconds ago. Who created the, the random name generator? Because those are pretty <laughs> funny, usually. That has been around since the dawn of the Docker era. It's always a adjective plus typically a famous scientist and or literary figure. OK. Has so been we going. got our names on there, then. Yeah. Well, we can, I can, you know, if we talk afterwards, I can see if I can get yeah. you on the oh, list. Oh, sponsorship. You know. This is what you need to do. <laughs> oh, yes. You didn't hear that from me. It's recorded, right? Uh, okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to put up this application. You can see it's binding to port 32772. So it binds from the internal port of the container, which is 5000, to the external port of the, of the VM that I'm running, which is 32772. So let's do that. Uh, and using Docker for Mac, I can use localhost. 32772. Might take a, oh, maybe not. Oh, because it's HTTPS. That's not correct. It is. Defaulting this. I think I have to automatically do it. So, this is what CatWeb does. It, um, well, it shows you cat GIFs. It's probably not the most oh, useful of apps, on. but yeah, you can just keep refreshing and you can get cat drifts. This is what I do all day, if anyone's wondering. This is, this is my work. Uh, so that's running on a local VM. Now let's say we want to take, um, take this and run it in the cloud. Now normally if you if you're created a VM-based application, unless you use some sort of open standard, as you say, uh, you can't very easily tr you know, manipulate this app and put it into a cloud service. I created using DigitalOcean, which is a public cloud provider. I created this, uh, this uh, 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 droplet, which is like a single VM in, in their terminology. So I'm going to quickly just SSH into that. Hopefully I remember my password. I do. OK, so let's see if this is already running a Docker engine. There's nothing running right now. But if I do the same exact application, dash D, So the image is on your Mac? So the image is stored in the cloud right now. Okay. So I've put it in what's called Docker Hub, which is our public repository where you can store images. Uh, so this is, Harish Jay is one of, our, one of our folks on our team, so it's his repository. So again, the image is what you actually created out of. I've put it, on the, uh, we've put it publicly available on the web, so I can grab it from anywhere. That's, but you can also make it private if you choose to do so. And we'll talk about actually some of our products that really are, are about running this in an on-prem secured environment. Uh, but if I run that, okay, it quickly created that container. So this is again 32769. So let's see if I run this. And I better make sure to make that HTTP. Folly of live demos. Here we go. So very quickly, you can run an application Maybe not, you know, maybe you wouldn't do something as simple as this, but you can run an application in pretty much any environment you want. And the idea is you can easily, you know, portably move your applications across environments. Obviously, I'm extracting away some of the simple simplicity by doing a single container, but you can imagine how this could be abstracted to a much larger environment. So that's what I have right now for our intro section. Happy to take any questions. So, I mean, the only thing you actually had running was a Docker engine? That's correct. Was sitting on the cloud and also the Mac doc. Docker Mac, whatever it was a Docker engine for Mac. It's effectively a Docker engine in a little Linux VM. Yeah. 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 And part of our idea is, you know, if a developer is running their if local you environment, to, you could fire up an AWS instance and 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 uh, load it there too. Exactly. And actually, we have templates that make it really easy to set up a VM in AWS with a Docker engine attached to it. Uh, we can maybe show off some of that later. Uh, but yeah, you can run this in in pretty much any cloud. AWS, Azure, DigitalOcean, take your pick. All you have to do is install the Docker engine, grab the image that the application is based off of, and do a Docker run command. For more complicated apps, you'll increase you know, the amount of containers you run, maybe put a load balancer in front for a more complicated application. But that's the gist of it.
How do you handle uh, resource allocation from uh, at, at the container level, or is that handled, it's handled by the engine? It's handled at the engine. So okay. when you create a container, you can set shares okay. of both compute and memory uh, around, and, and you can, if you don't do anything, it defaults to just taking up resources as necessary, but you can reserve a certain set of percentage uh, of shares as you need. And are those reserved, or are they, uh, so for example, if you're basically over-allocating, like in a VM sense, uh, can you ever allocate with reserved or is it an actual reservation? That's a good question. Hey, Andre, you know the, do you know the answer to that one? Can you over allocate with, uh, with shares? Yes. Uh, there's uh, my company. Yeah, so you can do, there's a separation between reservation and limits. So you get to decide what are the limits and how much you want to reserve for that particular service. Um, so you can over-allocate by uh, having like higher limits than your, your reservation. So you can do over-commit or you can have different um, style of QoS. Uh, you can do best effort and so on and so on. Okay, cool. Thanks. Sure. So where is this application getting the GIFs? I mean, is it permanent storage someplace or? This one is just linking to some websites. I think it's actually BuzzFeed. Yep, courtesy of BuzzFeed. So this one's linking statically. You can use what's called volumes which are another, uh, another container term which allow, so containers themselves are stateless effectively. Uh, they exist as soon as you close them down, the, their resources are gone. You can create what's called a volume, which is basically a reference to some state, stateful piece. Uh, and that can contain, say, any stored information you want. That volume could reference a folder on a local hard drive, but in a production capability, that wouldn't be a, a, a very good idea. You can also have a, use a volume driver to reference, for example, a storage array, or if you're running in the cloud, something like AWS S3 or EBS. So basically, volumes allow you to abstract away to some storage service, whether that's local or whether that's an actual <laughs> real enterprise grade storage service. Flocker drivers come into this thing, or, or Flocker, you know what Flocker is? I do, yeah. I, I worked with the Cluster HQ guys before. So Flocker created a driver that allows you to plug in various other storage backends behind it. So uh, the engine. Uh, behind, the, the, behind their volume driver. So there's a, t a lot of different volume drivers that allow you to connect different storage platforms. Flocker's product, if I understand correctly, allows you to plug in different volume drivers behind their one unified interface. If that makes sense, so and then that so then the Flocker API serves as the basis for volumes, and then other storage systems can sit behind that. So if it's if Docker containers are all stateless, what do you do with them? You must have to have some sort of state someplace. Well, like really you can do run something. You can run. <laughs> Wait, never mind. I don't think I can say that out loud yet. Uh, there are database containers, but that would be stateful. No. Yeah. What? Database. State. Yeah, as state well, though, I, I don't know. The state of the database, but the container itself is not, yeah. So where does that state reside in that environment? But wait a minute, though. Be careful, because if you stop a container and start one, everything that's in it is still there. It's only if you, it's no. like, yes. No. Yes. Yes. Stateless. Yes. State yes. State no. Stateless. State no, said no, stateless. No, no, no. It's not very stateful. good stateless. for stateless workloads. You, if you write a file to a container and stop it and restart it, the file is still there. Sorry, yeah, it's like, it's like a VM if you stop it. All the data is still there. It only goes away if you delete it. So uh, for, for stateful containers, you can use uh, volumes with uh, like volume drivers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so there are like many different volume drivers. And you can use like your cloud provider driver. Like if you're running on I don't know, AWS, then there's a driver to use EBS. So you can put like your stateful containers. Yep. So you spin those apps forward. up. You can spin them very yep. wide horizontally. Yeah. talking back to S3 or EBS or a database service or something like that. But the idea is you can scale these up, bring them down, and move them between whatever cloud provider you want to put them in without having to redo the entire stack. Yeah, right. I mean, think of it like this. So if you create a database container on your workstation and you create some tables and some other things and you make that an image and you push it up to the registry and then you go to another computer and you pull that down, the database isn't going to be there. Like the tables won't be there. But everything else inside, when you logic create the file, logic wise, yeah. But on my computer where I created it, those tables will still be there unless the database sits on a volume using the volume driver. 